Hi, this is Blake at Human Factor, and we make podcasts for associations easy in three ways. Just remember www. First, the why. Why are we creating this podcast? And are there any others like it? This will help us implement a strategy for success and help find a way to integrate the podcast into your existing strategy. The next is workflow. We have to figure out a workflow to get the show recorded. Whether you want to come to our studio, record on the road, or record from your office, we've done it all so we can figure out what's best for you and what fits your budget. Last is the what, as in what to do with this. Since now we have goals to find in the strategy and some content created, we can talk about how to promote the show and maximize this content. We can figure out what social media platforms and different ways to boost it to the listenership. At Human Factor, we love helping membership-based organizations with their podcasts and add value to their community. For more tips and tricks, free videos and articles about podcasting, go to humanfactor.net. Welcome to Association Chat, produced by Amplified Growth and Human Factor, talking about all things association, nonprofit, and anything else that pops into my mom's head. And now, here is your host, Kiki Latalian. All right, we're here, Blake. Oh my gosh. And we're not even doing it on a Tuesday. No. It's crazy. What's she going to say this time? It's a good question. She asks me that. I don't know what to say, but uh, yeah. You shouldn't. I actually do, though. I never know what we're going to say. You don't know what we're going to say. I have a pretty good idea about at least what we're going to talk about. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty. (laughs) Pretty. So I have a question for you, actually. Shoot. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, this whole thing about fake news and, uh, you know, the media is the enemy and not. How do you feel about how much you trust organizations right now how much you know how much do you trust what you see or hear my lovely wife works at afp okay agence france press i believe the ap so we Mm -hmm. have long discussions about this and then what is fake news exactly like here's an example are you it's it it, like everyone has a little bit of bias Mm -hmm. one way or the other Mm -hmm. so as an example you could be Mm pro-life or anti-abortion you know that kind of thing so um and we have long discussions about this because she works with a bunch of journalists all day long. So do I have an opinion? Yeah. I don't know exactly know what fake news is. It's like porn. I know it when I see it. Well, let's talk about trust. And and we're going to get into this. We're going to go actually into uh, talking about communications challenges that leaders and executives in organizations are facing every day. Every day. Uh, No matter where you are in the world, we are living in a time when there is an amazing amount of political unrest, societal norms are changing, and at the same time, we still have to communicate. And so leaders for organizations, leaders for associations, communication leaders are all trying to figure out, you know, how do we communicate without making everyone upset with us how do we do this in a way where we can get stuff done and not have people disconnect right out of the gate it's an amazing problem and we're going to tie this we're going to tie this into associations we're going to be amazing it's all about associations and organizations who are trying to figure out how to make this communication happen because there's a lot that needs to be done and and we need to figure out how to do it. But so, before we do that... So, my first thing to say about communications is I want to thank our sponsors. Yes. I want to thank our wonderful sponsors, Human Factor. You want to say I'm, hi, I'm, Human I'm putting Factor? It up. Hi, hi, Human Factor. Uh, yeah, doing po- what do we do again? We do... <laughs> putting it up on the screen there we go we do podcasts for associations and organizations uh-huh and who else who's next the human workplaces let's do let's stay with the humans All human right, workplaces the humans. hold on there that's on the screen now there yep and what that's do they do it. uh human workplaces all about workplace culture you want to look at figuring out how to make things a little bit nicer where you are and how people can work together better talk to human workplaces 
All right. So here's ampl- a new one. Ampl- oh, oh, I was going to talk about amplified growth and then go. All right. Do amplified growth. Amplified growth, uh, community architect and digital strategy technologist. That's me. If you want to ask how to communicate with folks and bring people together, I can help you do that. Right. And Boulder. This is the new sponsor. Welcome Boulder to becoming a sponsor, a trusted partner with Association Chat. And they engage in digital transformation projects for associations. And they said a nice thing about you. They said an amazingly nice thing about you. You're going to read that whole thing? Um, How about about the first paragraph? I'll read the first paragraph. I mean, the first sentence, maybe. (laughs) (laughs) You know what? Um, I think that maybe we should save it for another time. Okay. All right. So let's move on and talk about our topic for today. All right. So I'm going to read this little thing. There was a uh, there was a quote that came from Phil Riggins. He's the founder of the Brand and Reputation Collective, the BRC in the UK. Okay. And he says that he lives by this mantra, and it is you're only two clicks away from uncovering a lie. All right. Is that true? The 2019 Edelman Trust Barometer reveals that trust has changed profoundly in the past year. People have shifted their trust to the relationships within their control, most notably their employers. Huh. Globally, 75% of people trust my employer to do what's right, significantly more than NGOs at 57%, business 56%, and media, 47%. So regularly, Edelman's trust barometer comes out, and um, the last couple of years, it's been really, really low on media and Just government. Media. On media and government. And government. And government. But what and about so, associations? Well, associations, all right, this yeah. is part of what we're going to get into. So what I want to do is I want to talk with, I want to introduce our guest for today. Yeah, we got a bunch. Yeah, we do. And so, and a couple of them might be jet lagged with us today. Oh, yeah? Yes. And so I want to introduce Gary LeBranch. He's the president and CEO of the National Investor Relations Institute. I want to introduce... Oh, thank thank you, you for being with us. Uh, I want to introduce Matthew Duva. He is the executive director of the International Association for the Study of Pain. Pain. Yeah. Hello, Hi. And then uh, Nick Parker. He's the president of Frederick Reed Marketing, Media, and Communications, and also the <laughs> president and publisher of the Link to Lee's Summit podcast. Cool. So he has an interesting perspective. Who are we starting with? We're starting with Gary and with Matt. Um, and it's whoever jumps into this first. So because of this recent Edelman trust barometer, the, the findings that come from that, and many of the news stories that we're seeing about data breaches, fake news, uh, the changes in cultural mores, um, how has that actually impacted the way that you communicate or has it? And have you felt more pressure in how you communicate with the people that you're responsible for communicating with, with your audience? Um, So I'll start with that because, you know, with associations, you've got boards, councils, your members, the public, the media. So um, Gary or Matt, which one of you feel so inclined to jump in? Well, uh, good morning. This is Gary, and uh, it's a... great to be here with you uh, again and i am a little jet, jet lag i just returned from uh 10 days in australia so uh, good day mates <laughs> and all that uh, business if you ever get a chance i highly recommend visit sydney australia um but i was you know as i was uh, uh, thinking about this topic i was uh, reminded of a quote from a, an, another famous american who said uh, that in the last 10 years uh this trust in media and in public institutions has dramatically declined more so than uh, in his entire lifetime. Of course, that famous American was John Adams, who said that in 1798. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm not so sure. <laughs> true, true, absolutely true story. So I, I'm not so sure that uh, distrust in institutions and media is necessarily a new thing. Uh, I think it's a more present thing, and I, fe- I think we all feel it more painfully today. I certainly do. Um, and um, I was, uh, it was interesting to read the Edelman uh, the Trust Barometer. Edelman is uh, one of my members, and so we actually covered this, uh, the, the, their Trust Barometer, every single year. Uh, and I actually got to visit with uh, the folks on their team that were responsible in part for, for putting, putting that uh, Trust Barometer out. 
Uh, it's an interesting uh, methodology that they use. I, I found it interesting that uh, NGOs, as they're termed in this uh, in this survey, associations and other nonprofits, uh, are actually rated higher than many other types of institutions mm -hmm. like business and media itself. That we're quite uh, ahead of media. So uh, you know, I, I do think that that shows the relationship of uh, members to their associations. Uh, as a as a community of, 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 of trust. Now, I'm not saying that they trust everything we say or everything that is said by the association, but I, I do think that um, uh, members, because of their affinity, their loyalty, their connection with their membership organization, uh, do look to their organization as a source of trusted news and information. Um, and to the extent that we meet that um, expectation and carry that culture of trust, um, then I think we're we're really serving a very valuable purpose. The extent that we help to uh, disseminate uh, bad information or perpetuate uh, fake news, uh, I think then that trust starts to break down very, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Matt, Matt, what do you think about that? So I agree <laughs> <laughs> with the wise yes. guy of the branch, of course. Uh, and, and so I... I, I too was very excited, pleased to see um, the, the high mark that NGOs uh, fared in the survey. Um, we, as at ISP, we are an NGO. We are actually officially in relations with the WHO, the World Health Organization, and really serve in that role. Um, and, and I think that as an, as an NGO and as an association, um, and additionally as a scientific society, uh, we make our living, we, make, we build our reputation on science and evidence-based information and credibility. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know that we have necessarily as an organization changed the way that we communicate with our members or with, with outside audiences. But I do think that one of the things that, that we are ex even more vigilant potentially about is recognition and the importance of evidence-based decision-making of of data um, and using data to make informed decisions, whether it's decisions that affect our members or affect patients or affect uh, clinical treatment, um, or simply how we communicate and what we communicate our, our about our organization and what we do and how effectively we do that. So um, if I like to be a positive person. <laughs> so if there's a positive spin to what I think was a negative question, mm -hmm. uh, not to put words in yeah. your mouth, <laughs> but I, I do think that's an opportunity for us as, as leaders and 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 in leading organizations um, to be mindful of our important role of building that credibility and being that that maybe that voice of reason or maybe that uh, that showing that leadership role in making sure that we're we're pushing for for evidence, for science, and for uh, for the building of that science. Right. I mean, I think that's such a challenge because I was having a discussion actually with um, one of your colleagues who, uh, Kristen Clark, who I hope she doesn't mind that I bring bring her name into this, but uh, she she I'm was sure telling she me <laughs> that um, some of the word choices just because internationally. Um, if you were to use the word uh, national, it could accidentally be used. Uh, it just mentioning it in an article, it could make people think of nationalist, which would lead into a negative direction. And she was telling me that um, even in the crafting of messages, that a lot of times it's word choices. It's things that that she's had to become more aware of and that it's, it's an ongoing learning process. I think that because of... Um, because of all of the different things that are coming up today with our society in the United States, with um, the changes that are happening globally, um, you know, with women and the women's movement, uh, Me Too, I know that there are a lot of sensitivities that are taking place um, and, and people are worried about saying the wrong thing. How how do you as you know leaders in your organizations grapple with that when you go out and you're speaking extemporaneously all the time? You know, um, when I was putting together my my thoughts and my questions for today's discussion, um, I, I immediately thought of well, you know, maybe 
maybe they're just so good that they don't they don't worry about this. They don't ever find themselves searching for the right thing to say. But I'm like, come on, you know, it has to be at a point where you're like, ooh, okay, tread lightly here. Um, and I just wondered if you had established any rules for the road, so to speak, um, as things have gotten a little bit more complex. And that's that. I'll, I'll, this is where you address the person. I know, I know. Say, I'm, Nick, what well, do you I'm, think of that? So, <laughs> and, and sometimes I'm just thinking that somebody's going to be on the edge of their seat and like, oh, but you, you, I've got the rules. I'm saying Gary. I'm saying Gary. I saw him look like he was moving toward he, to say, I'm looking at nonverbals. <laughs> Little, it's a little more difficult uh, using this sort of technology, and you're not quite there. You can't pick up on those immediate immediate yes. cues. But uh, I, uh, it's, it's a very good question, and it's, I think it's a very difficult uh, thing to manage these days. And I'll give you a personal example. I, I write a weekly column to my membership, and I cover all sorts of topics. And obviously, one of them is advocacy because we we advocate on behalf of our members. Our members are. are senior executives in all of America's publicly traded companies. So we represent the capital markets community. Uh, so it's a, the, big, the largest uh, uh, publicly traded company in America. And um, so I was uh, simply sharing our sort of a, a, an, an analysis of the, where things are playing with our new Congress uh, now in session, uh, you know, where our, how our advocacy positions stack up against the chairs the, and the new chairs of our key committees. Uh, and I sort of went through, this is what the, this chair thinks of our positions, and here's a quote from that person, and here's this uh, subcommittee chair, and here's where, you know, we, we think we might have disagreements and why, and here's a quote from that person. I'm a very factual, very, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, I got immediate um, uh, uh, letters or emails uh, coming back, most saying, oh, positive things. It seems going to be more difficult now with the, with the new Congress and, and everything. But I got couple of people back to me saying that I was anti-woman wow. and I was anti-woman because uh, while I had ad- 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 accurately quoted uh, the two women chairs and their you know the positions on our positions or their response to our positions and I had quoted two male chairs uh, on their responses which were pretty much the same um, uh, it was perceived as anti-woman because I I was seen as disagreeing with a female committee mm-hmm. chair. And all, all I was doing was simply saying this was her you know, vi- uh, views of our positions, just as I said, this is his views of our position. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I, would not, I would not have anticipated that uh, something like that would have been viewed as anti-woman. Uh, but at least two readers thought that that was anti-woman simply because I disagreed with uh, a female member of Congress's uh, position relative to our uh, publicly stated position, and that clearly, you know, I was a, I was a right wing and you know all these <laughs> extremists and all these sorts of things. Very, very out of proportion blowback to this sort of thing. And uh, I shared that with my female uh, uh, chair and uh, income chair, and uh, they were were incredulous yeah. that that was a response, and they assured me that they didn't share that view having worked with me and that sort of thing. So it's it just sort of comes out uh, in ways that I think are somewhat least expected. And and I what I've taken what I've learned from that experience is you really do have to think through um, potential responses to every single thing mm-hmm. you say. Um, and we now rehearse uh, practice, if you will, um, uh, key phrases that we have tried to hone so as to make our positions clear or our point of view clear uh, while uh, trying to protect any uh, opportunity for others to come back and either flip that comment in a negative way or uh, twist that comment in in a different way than than was intended or somehow offend someone. Because you never know these days how something something will offend I'm curious, how many people did the, uh, did that, do we know how many people saw that, the thing you wrote? Oh, a couple thousand. So two out of a thousand, mm-hmm. I'm just... or two out of two thousand. Yeah. yeah. And I got more. I got more positives. I got twenty or thirty people saying, "Oh, thank you. This is right on." Right. You know that sort of thing. But I did get two that were not only but they didn't necessarily disagree with what I had to say. They simply thought that my comments were anti-women because I disagreed oh, with yeah. two women. 
I mean, it's a it's a danger. And I, I know that things um, even back in the day when I was communicating with a number of different international chapter leaders and things like that back when I worked in associations, um, I remember that it was already complicated because you are things like humor in uh, emails and stuff that that doesn't always translate the best. And you have to you already have to be sensitive about the way that you communicate. But I feel that people are on hyper alert for a number of different, you know, what's their stance on this and and trying to look for. um, I agree. Trying to look for areas where there might be difficult. And I I can't even imagine, you know, the pressure that I would feel at that point. I feel pressure even for association chat and and feel like I have to be careful about some of the things that I say here too. I do. (laughs) <laughs> we need to talk after this episode. But hold Blake, on, really. but I think there's something to I that. <laughs> but, I mean, every, someone's going to be offended. Yeah. And and isn't that the uh, what we always talk about with the um, the associations that that they don't take the risks? Well, we, a bunch of chickens. There are not. It's not a bunch of. We have we have a lot of. That's nice. It's a nice sound effect. I'm very impressed that you could just pull it out like that. Um, and Michael, who is watching right now, hi Michael. He says, "Don't you think the issue stems from our inability to talk generally about gender and race? To talk generally." about gender and race, that it's been so sensitive for so long that the problem is that we can't, right? We, we can't have just a regular discussion about it, that we have to dance around these topics. Yeah. And you might have, you might have something there. Um, Stacy says, while it's important to be inclusive, if you're constantly walking on eggshells with hopes to not offend anyone, how effective can you get the message across? How effectively? Thank you. She, I mean, you can tell that she's an editor because she went back and edited her, her <laughs> comment in the chat. Well, good for yes. her. Yes. I, I like know. Her. Well, and hearing your voice, Nick, that that makes me think I need to bring you into the fray. We need to talk with Nick be- because... Uh-oh. Um, is Nick going to offend us? Is he going to say something offensive? Well, Nick, Nick, <laughs> I hope his, so. I don't know his history. We go back. We're, we I, I was hearing stories university. before you came on. We went to the same university, so difficult. He has journalism in his blood. You did. Um, yep. So, Nick, you dance this dance between marketing and communications for your clients, and you host a podcast with a regional focus. It's in. Lee Summit, Missouri. (laughs) And so, you know, I'm sure that as you're representing different businesses and you're helping people with their communications, that you occasionally run into some communication challenges. And so what I want to find out from you is have you have you felt the sting of a lack of trust in media in your experience? And how is that showing up for you and your business today? Well, I, I absolutely do straddle both of them. And, and thanks for having yeah. me on, Kiki, because it's awesome to see how great you've done in the last 20 years, 25 years. <laughs> Don't tell. Years why, why, are together, you, so. why are you sharing numbers? <laughs> why? I'm, I will, uh, I will allow them to donate money to a good cause, and I'll tell all the bad stories. <laughs> oh, can we get his video <laughs> off now, yeah, Blake? You, you have yes. those buttons. I'm going to cut them out. Okay. You know, I, 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 I do straddle both lines, and, and, and you, you generously actually called my podcast regional. It's not. It's very hyper-local for, for a reason. I have a local um, site linked to Lee Summit and then a, a partnering podcast, Lee Summit Town Hall, uh, mainly because I just wanted to be in media again. I spent most of my life there. Uh, but I think a lot of that lack of trust mm-hmm. – in media and what it what it is it it starts on a local level i think you've seen a decline in locally owned newspapers and 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 other news media and that people don't know the guy that covers their town right Hmm. Hmm. and and so that makes it very hard then to trust the regional tv person and then the national tv person because you don't have that relationship with the person who brings you the news anymore and so so i've made a very intentional move to just talk about things here and to talk about the people in their backyard. I, I'm very fond of telling people that you have more ability to affect change right in your backyard than you do anywhere mm-hmm. else. So this is the place to get involved. Yeah. And for, for associations to bring it back around, you know, I think that, um, that it, that's the professional home for many, for many people, you know, they look to their associations as being, um, their organizations of record for their profession, for their industry, um, for the science that that 
you know, and the research that goes into that, they look to to organizations like associations as being this very trust centered. Um, Isn't that everything for type an of entity? Though? Well, but here's the. Yeah, I think you have to think, and I tell my clients this: you have to think of your association, yeah. or your business, or whatever you have. Today, today, your business is news. And so you have to think of it that way when you're when you're communicating out and reaching out to your audience. So, so you know, for Matt, for Gary, you, your audience and your your local news is spread out across the globe, but it's still local because it, it's 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 that thing that mm-hmm. niche is still their backyard. Yeah, I would. I, here's my thing for you guys. Like, like my my issue. <laughs> I have so many issues. My <laughs> issue is that I uh, won't even go there. <laughs> Why is everyone laughing? Everyone. <laughs> the whole panel laughed. I know. And the tech. <laughs> People online are laughing. Oh, guys, it's like you know me. So, so, but no, my thing is, is that, so while I said this, like it's fact, like, like, uh, you know, associations are these great things that people have a lot of trust in and faith in. <sighs> I had, you know, we had we had a guest a couple weeks ago, um, awesome guest, and he just he said, you know, associations just have a, you know, we don't have to worry about trust. We have trust, and just went on to another to another topic, and I I, I put a pin in that, and I thought I've got to come back to that because actually I think that um, we may be facing a time when. That's up for question. What the trust? I do, I think so, and and this is what I wanted to ask our guests because once upon a time it wasn't that you not only communicated and networked and all of this stuff in your in your profession um, on on social media and all of these different places you didn't go to a million different resources but in a, in an age now. Um, in an age now when you are unsure of what the boundaries are between what's real and what's not real, you have deep fakes in video, you, you have the technology to change um, what it even looks like that somebody's saying on a, on a video, you have the ability to pull you know, facts and records from... You're quoting facts there, right? I'm quoting facts. But you know, you're finding these things online, um, and I say you, I mean the press, We're finding things online that aren't necessarily verified. And so I think people are, in general, feeling this sense of distrust more now because we're we're in a state of change. We're in a a state of a lot of change. And associations, too, right? We we, Well, they're media companies now. They've got to be. They have to be media companies. Or they have to hire a company like Amplify Grover Human Factor to help them with the media. (laughs) Well, okay, so but, no, but so, I mean, I'm only plugs. half joking there. I mean, you have to if you can't do it, you got to find a way to, to to get the word out of for your for your message, right? I mean, you do. I want to talk to these guys though, yeah. and find out how are you? Do you how are you dealing with it on a strategic level, or or just even philosophically as you're approaching as you're approaching uh, communicating with your members like this? Are you feeling this? Are you seeing this? Well, I. I, I I'm curious to what they say, but don't you always have to treat it as you would any other relationship that you're, you, you have to constantly be working to build trust and constantly be working to, to show that, that, that the relationship between, between the two people matter? I mean, it, doesn't it just scale at that point? I, yeah. yeah I, this, this, is, this is Matthew. Um, is my connection okay? Yeah, you, went, you went out for a little bit, but you're back with the red curtain. You look fantastic. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I apologize. I'm, I'm at a hotel, so the, the connection I don't think is as wonderful no as it would be. Um, so at ISP, we, we truly have a global audience. Only a third of my members are in North America, a third are in Europe, a third are in uh, the Asia-Pacific region, and then the remaining members are in Latin America and in, and in Africa. So we're, we always try and strive to be sensitive about... Um, language in general. So whether it's using language that um, is, you know, cliche language and that would be understood by an American audience, but not understood globally, Mm -hmm. working towards that, working towards, um, you know, so I think there's always that sensitivity. I I, I do think though, to your point about what's the book or what's the set of rules, I think it's really hard in that context to then have a set of rules. I think that there are a couple of things 
that at least I'm always sensitive to. And, and one is I think people may come into reading and may have a perspective that is based on something bigger than than you present yourself. So I, I, first of all, don't try to take things personally. So it is impossible for me not to be an American when I communicate with people. We are in and we are a global organization. And in theory, as their executive director, CEO, I can sit in any region of the world and be able to do my job. However, I am an American. I have an American accent and I sit in Washington, right. D.C. Those are yeah. facts. So as, a, as such, when I make comments, there may be some uh feelings or some assumptions that are placed upon me because of that understanding of what people may feel about what Americans think, do, mm -hmm. or say. Um, so I try to be sensitive to that. I try to be, I try to recognize that. And I try to recognize that um, and talk about that with my team as we're building and sending communications out. I think what we can debate whether or not that's fair, um, but I think it's fact, so it's mm -hmm. not it's, and to me, it's factual and is real. I also think that um, what, and maybe this is coming from a, a again the scientific perspective of my members. Um, I don't have as much of a concern if a member writes back because they don't like something that I'm saying. I look at it as an opportunity to engage with them in the dialogue. So maybe it's an apology because they understood something that wasn't my intention. Um, or whether it's an opportunity to learn some nuance of a cultural competency that I didn't, I wouldn't have had an opportunity to understand. Um, I, I, I think when I go into our communications and I think our team does, we sort of recognize that, um, I wouldn't say we recognize that we may offend every time we send something out, but we recognize the fact that it's impossible to truly understand and to be sensitive to all the cultural sensitivities that may exist. And we just try to do our best to, to navigate those and speak with respect and be as transparent if we miss that. Um, so I, I think it's been a very humbling experience working in this job um, because it, I think the ability to step in uh, to, to sort of miss something is maybe mm -hmm. higher. I don't know, higher, but it's high. <laughs> Um, and so I, I try to be as humble as I can and, and, you know, try to have my team where we try to work together to support each other. Um, and I rely on my volunteers to sort of check me on that as well and, you know, their own perspectives that they bring. But I, I, I find that people are more forgiving mm -hmm. than sometimes I am of myself. And I, so that's been kind of a, a I love that. Can we put let's let's just hold on to that thought. I want to break for just a second. You guys who are watching live right now, we're going to break for just a second while we hear a word from our sponsor. We're going to come right back and then we're going to come to an even better part of the section. We're going to get you tease? really Let's hear your tease. Let me tease. I'm not teasing anything. Tease are you it kidding? Up. We're going to come back. You're going to find out what's going to be happening at events like ASAE's Great Ideas. We're going to be doing all kinds of things. Talking about all kinds of fantastic events. You guys, hold on to your horses. It's about to get crazy. Okay. <laughs> Culture tip number five, technology equals culture. In this day and age, every organization relies heavily on technology to get the job done, but have you ever thought about the impact of your technology choices on culture? Because you should. The technology you use internally can facilitate the behaviors you know you need inside your culture to make you successful, or it can get in the way. So choose wisely. Does each department use a different internal collaboration tool? No, no wonder your silos are so strong. Are you using technology to enable peer-to-peer -peer feedback or is all the feedback top-down through your performance review? When you align your tech choices with your culture priorities, you'll see increased success. That was Culture Tips brought to you by humanworkplaces.net. 
All right, so we're back. How was that? Don't you just love these segments? I am so thankful to our sponsors for giving us a little something, a little palate cleanser. Little something, before something. We, yes, before we move on into other parts of the discussion. So again, if you're just joining us, uh, then you've missed a fantastic part of the Shame. conversation. But, Shame but, on you. You still have a chance because we're talking with Gary LeBranch, with Matt Duva and Nick Parker. And we're talking about... We're talking about the challenges that we face in communications today as leaders, as communications experts, when we're talking with so many different constituents. And so we talked about a lot of the different challenges that we faced both uh, at home and globally. But what I also wanted to find out is I wanted to start talking with you guys about the stories. And we, we heard just a couple of stories so far, but I want to maybe take a look you at... You know, people being professionally offended, that kind people of thing? Being, people getting offended, people responding back, talking about the things that um, you know, they're extremely sensitive about. And yeah. there are sometimes very good reasons for that. Quite an impressive radio voice, Kiki. I hate mine, even after all these years. You guys rock. Thank you for writing in. That is awesome. Let's get a story from uh, one of these guys. I'm well, you know what? I need a story from Nick, because I haven't heard... I want to hear Nick's voice. I feel like that's the music that we're we're missing right now. The Nick's voice? Yes. Nick, uh, tell us a story. I was enjoying the music. <laughs> Let's only get me on for another four seconds, so... Okay. Four more seconds. <laughs> Nick! You know... You know, we right now in our community are, are, are uh, the story that I'll tell you is actually what's happening right now we, in our school district. The superintendent has lofted a launched a new mission about equity in mm-hmm. education. So we're talking about diversity, diversity in the staff, how we're dealing with um, behavioral issues in there. And that's forcing this community to at some point we're going to have to have that conversation about right. race. And you said in the very beginning of the show, you talked about. Mm-hmm. race and it's hard and, and and gender discussions are hard and this is a town and Gary I guess you you lived in Kansas City once so you know Lee Summit is a town it's a very privileged town it's a lot very very much white and so it's hard and I think when you talk about being offended and you talk about our biases when it comes to media and these conversations it really all boils down to to, to fear it, it, yeah like everyone is afraid yeah. of being labeled something that's bad People don't want to be called a racist. And so it's hard to talk about race and to talk about issues because we're all so scared that you might call me a racist. And so one of the things I've been trying to do is is, is not only how to have that conversation, but how to facilitate at a local level that conversation in an effective way. And it's 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 really it's really, really difficult. So what do you to do? do? It is hard. No, yeah. What do you do? Great question, Blake. Ding ding. Look at me. I got a great question. That never <laughs> happens, guys. <laughs> well, I think what we're going to do is we're actually going to take our our podcast live, and we're going to do a we're going to do a town hall wow. meeting, and we're going to bring the the superintendent of schools who happens to be an African American. We're going to bring a lot of people together, and we're going to we're just going to put all the questions out there, and we're going to see where That's we can scary. go, and almost force the conversation to happen. Hmm. Yeah, I I well, good luck with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's uh, it's interesting because I think you're right. I think the fear a lot of times um, it causes us to definitely play it safe. And you know, I can say that um, even for association chat, as as edgy and out there for the association community as I think association chat can sometimes be, I chicken out a lot, a lot. I um, help her with this, guys. <laughs> Can I, can I, can I, I'm going to actually jump in and say, I don't think it's the chicken. What do you effect. think it is? I, I think we're so at a, at a, at a broad 30,000 foot level of a society. We're so there's, there's just rampant righteous indignation. Mm, mm-hmm. You know, we all want to be right. And I think, you know, we all look for that, that drop the mic moment. Right. And we want, we want those quick, quick phrases to say we won. And we want to say that we picked the right team when it, when we voted in the state and the national ones. And so, so I think I don't think it's chicken. I, I think I'm, it's we don't I'll want speak to be for wrong. myself. I'll say I chicken out. I totally chicken out sometimes. And and the reason why is because um, it is fear. I don't I don't want to accidentally offend someone. Um, and I feel also out of touch. Like I I 
can't possibly keep up with all of the conversations, all of the acronyms, all of the everything that's going on. And but who can? Well, I don't think anybody can. I really so don't, unless of? that's what you... This is, I feel like a therapy session. So what are you scared of? Well, it's I mean, is it, with my you... mother. No, no. <laughs> yeah. it, it's... it's. Uh, I, I mean, I'm scared of accidentally offending people, and yes. But we already and, established you're going to. I mean, someone will be offended. Uh, he sent out a newsletter to 2,000 people, and people said he's, he's anti-woman because <laughs> he disagreed with a woman. Jesus does feel like therapy. Gary, can you help me out here? <laughs> Can I call a friend? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's... Uh, Lifeline? You know, uh, yeah, can you call the friend helpline? <laughs> whatever. I I, uh, I I feel your pain here because uh, uh, I have a daughter who's uh, in uh, just a freshman year of college, and uh, she happens to have been adopted. She's from India, uh, was her, her birthplace. So we have, for her the time she's been with us, uh, 19 years, um, you know, had been involved in conversations around race and and that sort of thing and i can give you some horrific stories about how people have responded to uh interracial families in a very negative way uh things that would make you weep uh uh uh, just it's amazing how much um racism is not below the surface that's Mm -hmm. right there on top of the surface but my, my point is now you know especially in her in last year in her senior year of high school and now in college, we have a new wrinkle uh, in, in these conversations with my daughter and her friends and her uh, whole the group, um, which is uh, the gender question. And the gender question is complicated by the whole uh, uh, scheme, uh, the whole uh, incredibly diverse world of pansexual, uh, you know, this kind of sexual, that kind of, the LGBTQ, et cetera, et cetera, right. et cetera, so that I, whenever uh, my daughter has a friend over, that person will say, my name is, and my, my pronouns really? are. Yeah. Uh, and so they have, they have to distinguish what their pronouns are, what their gender is, uh, and what their pronouns are. So it's not, un, uh, not at all unusual to say, to meet uh, someone who appears to be male, says male, uh, who is six foot two and 230 pounds and says, my name is Christine, and I go by they, uh, there and right. them. Yeah. And you sort of have to sort of, you know, as an old person, I have to sort of take that in, and then you're then you're constantly on guard because you don't. You want don't. To yeah, but you're you're, you're like, oh, voices, I can't trust the visual cues. Right. But it's so hard because it's not the grammar I grew up with. Right. First of yeah. all, you know, and so you you've got to be. It's so easy to then. And, and my daughter, of course, being hypersensitive to this, if we make a mistake, even in private conversation about how uh, was, you know, dinner at her, her house, it's not her, it's they. It's their house. Right. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. That, that, I know. mean, that would be Is very Margo difficult doing this? for me. Um, Margo's your daughter. So Margo's 11 years old, and she's already had um, questions, like meeting friends who were a little bit older in dance and stuff. Um, ask her, you know, what's her sexual pre- preference, and she she to came to me year after to an eleven year old. Did she ask you, mom? What's she my, she's like me. She's tall. Mom, what's she my looks sexual older. preference? And she came. She she told me after I picked her up from dance one day. She said, um, you know, that her friend had had talked with her about it, and she said, "What do you mean, like, you know?" And she goes. Well, you know, do you like boys or girls? She's like, I like everybody, you know, and she just because totally... I'm 11. But here's the thing is that I have friends who I have friends who like pansexual, all the different stuff. And I can't keep it straight. I can't. Yeah, I, can't. I can't. I don't. I'm going to do try, my best. But... And I'm like, guys, I mean, I mean, just I apologize ahead of time if I don't get it right. Um, and I will say that someone uh, watching was saying um, while you're planning your open meeting, Nick, Please include the issues for those who are non-binary and transgender and differently abled, ethnicity, et cetera. And Stacy says, we need better slash more pronouns in the English language. Okay. She's a writer. This is she is a writer, she actually. <laughs> she's writing more for words. the new she's writing for the new association chat zine. So All right. keep on. More Stacey, pronouns. Keep, yes, more pronouns. <laughs> I'll expect you to stay on top of those. Yes. Um let me know. I'm I'm doing my best, but I will say that it, it is it's definitely something that 
I'm constantly, you know, on guard about because I'm like, oh, I want to I want to address this issue, but I don't want to address it the wrong way. And I probably would have more discussions like this uh, if I weren't afraid that I'd be ostracized or something for um, saying the wrong thing. And and that's just me being on. That's just me right. being the, honest. The, 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 the smallest inconsequential mistake can be blown out of right. proportion just because you, you, you could be seen as not in touch or privileged in some way meanwhile i'm meeting people for the first time you know in a very you know quick uh, scenario at, at school you know at the university of arizona in my daughter's case and for 30 seconds and then two months later i'm supposed to remember their specific you know pronouns and all that sort of thing and i'm like I can barely remember. Well, it's a stress name. out. I mean, like you asked me oh, to, right. I'm, I'm like that with right. numbers. Right. And it's like somebody asked me to do a quick calculation and I kind of freak out. That's the kind, that's the same kind of thing that happens. It's just like a short circuit that happens in my brain. I'm like, yeah. uh, uh, I never asked uh, these guys their pronouns before we started. I didn't. Well, isn't it? Isn't what we're talking about, what we're talking about striving for here, isn't that what we're talking about is the thing that's missing from all of these conversations that we try to have? And that's context and empathy. I mean, that's what we're talking about that we strive for here. That's and a really that, good point. That's the thing that makes all of these discussions hard is because we seem to have lost. That's a really good point. That ability to use context, to acknowledge context, and to have empathy for other Well, empathy and leadership, you guys. Right. But, but, I, but I also think, but I, I agree with that, but, but I also think that part of it is recognizing, I think sometimes we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to get it completely yeah. right. And if somehow we don't get it right, we have to sort of talk it back as if we're trying to um, to sort of reframe the question so that we weren't as wrong. <laughs> and, and I think sometimes we just said, it's to, like you know, I think we just we don't want to be wrong. Right. But I think I think you are people are yeah. wrong. Like sometimes you get it wrong. I and love I think, this guy. You know, and that's, that's what I kind of talked about earlier about, you know, I I think I have more more of a sense of the fact that I'm going to miss a cultural norm when I send something out or when I have conversations with diverse groups. And, but I, I think part of it is I have found at least, and maybe this is too idealistic, but, but I have found that if you, I think you, sometimes we just have to be honest about the fact that we don't yeah. understand. We don't, we, we, we want to learn. Like if you, if you legitimately can communicate to somebody, I'm sorry, I did not mean to offend. I, help me understand your perspective so that I can learn something here that I can better understand. But sometimes I think we, we don't feel for some reason, we feel like we're supposed to know things that we mm -hmm. don't know. And then we pretend to sort of understand and empathize when we, when we don't have the context to empathize. So I think truly being empathetic is to be willing to be vulnerable yeah. to say, I don't understand your perspective. I, I have no context for it. Can we take five minutes for you to actually explain it to me? And I'm going to sit here and listen to you and take the information in and recognize that I'm going to okay. And I think yes, thank I, you. That is awesome. I'm dinging in here, and you the, are the you cued the how, look. I'll, I'll say we it. are so insane. When he met the six foot three, two hundred pound Christine, how on God's green earth were, were you supposed to know? I mean. And, and ask. I, I know, but we have to ask. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And it, but if you ask, am I being offensive? Like, or am I supposed to know? What things have changed? I guess since. since yeah, the, things have changed. I mean, you know. You have, you you have, have to, to ask. ask. How, how should I yeah. address you? You know, how should how how do you prefer to be called? How should I address you? Uh, you know, it's uh, it's interesting. I'm starting to see now this uh, uh, in uh, people's email signatures. Uh, for example. Yeah. Uh, the uh, rector of my church, you know, under his email signature, you know, the Reverend, you know, Charles Decay, uh, rector of St. Matthew's Fiscal Church, my pronouns mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. he, him, you know, that sort of thing. So, and I've seen, I'm starting to see this more and more and more, you know, that, that and I think this is all part of most, of, most people in my view uh, that I know in my privileged world and in, in most of my colleagues in the association community, um, our job is to not offend. It is to be inclusive and to be collegial and to welcome people. Right. That's what we do. You know, we try not to offend. We try to make people feel comfortable. And so I think part of the challenge with the whole concept of trust, and, and which then trust extends to the communication aspects, is that we try very hard to build that sense of community and trust 
And what we've become, what we become aware of these days, it is so hyper easy to um, be offensive to someone. Yeah. And I think that's increasingly going to be a challenge going going forward. And it's not for lack of caring or lack of authenticity uh, or lack of meaning or empathy. It is simply um, there are more opportunities to slip up, even things that are unbeknownst mm-hmm. to you, hmm. like a six foot to 200 pound person preferring to go by a different pronoun that you would right. imagine. That's such a great point, actually. I mean, and I do feel like, you know, we're really cutting to the heart of of what some of this is, because I, I think, I mean, you are all, you know, I know you all, and I know well-meaning people, and right. good people, smart people who want very much, it, it is our role, you know, um, to be inclusive and to do our very best to try to make everyone feel feel welcome and a part of to belong to the association that we're that a part we're of part or of running, running. Yeah. right and so um, and it's you know it's already something where we're I probably hyper aware of how other people are feeling and trying to be empathetic trying to build that empathy in our leadership skills and in our leadership abilities and the people around us trying to make sure that we we have the right people that are around the table to be diverse. And we, we're putting a lot of pressure, right, Matt? We're, I mean, you were talking about we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. Gary's saying we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. Nick's saying we, put, we do. We, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to get it right. And we're not always going to get it right. Stacy says, I know a few transgender people, including a f- uh, former in-law, and they understand that we're not conditioned to speak in they or there, but appreciate that we try. They're pretty understanding about it. Michael says, have you considered that some marketing concepts actually make conversations and context more difficult? One example is the idea of first in mind. Say it first and faster than anyone else. Dana says, you clearly have good intent and integrity. That makes the difference in me trusting your organization or any. She says, I find it much less stressful to be told whether a person prefers he or she or another pronoun than to figure it out myself. It's very true. That's true. That is true. I like that one comment about talking about speed and trying to be first. I think that's, that's hurts context a lot when you're, you are our social media tools. There's so many choices (laughs) now and you always want to get it out there and you want to respond quickly because people want a quick response, but sometimes we lose context and we lose that ability to give context to a conversation. When we have, and, and my media snob will come out, and that's why old newspapers were fantastic. Uh, I but mean, don't you sometimes yeah, TV. You sometimes wish that we could go back when we didn't have the expectation of responding immediately, right? Mm-hmm. But I also, the other, the other point that I would make is, I, I, I don't know if this is sort of taking us a little bit off topic, but I, but I do think that's why it's really important as association leaders to be committed to representation and diversity among our leadership and our decision making Mm -hmm. bodies. Because the more diverse we can be, the more perspectives we can bring to the table, the more helpful it is for all of us to be able to 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 be more sensitive and to be more empathetic because we can learn from each other. That's so true. Um and you know, I I think that's a critical piece of this because that that will help this process along no matter what how things evolve mm-hmm. in the future. Mm-hmm. I think it's a great point. You know, that, that is a, um, uh, an aspect of uh, uh, the, the criticality of diversity that I think uh, is, uh, is something that we need to all keep in mind that, you know, we are we're starting to see because of whether it's social media or the proliferation of, of communication channels or just simply uh, the, the greater ability for all of us, especially association leaders, to connect with so many people from different points of view and different walks of life and, and different uh, uh, philosophies um, that, you know, we need to be more uh, open and inclusive of not only people and types, but points of view, because that enriches the whole experience for everyone. And we have to keep in mind that that, that actually is, is critical to in, in cr- creating this sense of trust. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Everybody probably in this in this this group I know uh, probably and certainly most of the people in the association committee will know Glenn Tecker, mm-hmm. uh, Glenn Tecker and Associates International Consultants, that are a long, long time uh, co-author of the Will to Govern Well. Uh, in his uh, CEO symposia, he uh, 
he uses a, the phrase, um, uh, the uh, trust is the residue of promises kept. Trust is the residue. Trust is the residue of, of promises, promises kept. kept right? That's good. In other words, we build trust by ke- keeping our promises, by by delivering to people what we say that we're going to deliver or behave in a way that they expect us to behave. And that sort of residue of doing the things that we say we're going to do over and over and over builds this level of trust. I think as a piece of that, uh, going back to what Matt was saying, that the, the more uh, ability we have to seek out and engage and work with um, this, this variety of you know, range of diversities um, and being able to respond to all of those different groups is a piece of that building, that creation of the residue of promises kept of working with different people in different ways. That, I think, builds that sort of um, uh, shell, if you will, of at least give people the benefit of the yeah. doubt. Here we, we, we look, look at ABC organization and we see that they're inclusive and open and their leadership is, and their staff are diverse and they're open to different folks. And that gives us comfort that they all, that they're trustworthy. And now we have to figure out, you know, can, will they, will they perform? And versus looking at an association that seems closed and we don't see uh, everyone represented, that gives us pause to wonder if, could trust them. Well said. I think that's a piece. I don't of think I, I. I. I agree. Oh, I, go ahead. I was going to say I, I agree, and but I and I also think that the more representative groups, decision making bodies are, the more diverse they are, the better the group gets at responding and being vulnerable and being agile to changes that are happening in our world and changing perspectives. And I think, I think like anything, these are the types of learned skills that we as leaders have to build in our governing bodies, because this is, this kind of change, um, whether it's we're talking about pronouns or whether we're talking about how groups of people work together or whatever is going to become and is, I think, normal now. And we'll, that this this is what life is. And I just think that building that skill set is comes from building diverse groups that have voices in, in the decision making. I love that. I love that he put vulnerable, vulnerable in that list at the beginning. I, I almost want to steal Kiki's job and like ask him to expand on that a little more. <laughs> Don't do that. Meant, I, I, I Don't do that. We got to wrap up, man. I, I love that you. I love that you put vulnerable. In <laughs> it is good. I, I'm going to ask you guys just as we close out because um, this has been a fantastic discussion, but we do need to close out. I did have a request from somebody watching live if we can share who is where on the screen and the way that we're going to do this, guys. We're going to play a little game. All right. And I'm going to ask. Uh for each one of you to share your name and one thing you absolutely trust in this world without hesitation. And we're going to start with the man in the top left corner. That'd be Nick. Well, Nick's got to say his name and the thing he absolutely trusts. Okay, say hi, Nick, and the absolute thing you trust. That's me. I'm not in the top left, I guess. Oh, I'm Nick Parker, and here, I'll say it. I trust the media. He trusts the media? Wow. Oh, my gosh. Okay, well then... There are more of those good ones out there. Let's get smoking. <laughs> then let's go to Gary. Gary. I had to play that. Well, I'm glad to know there's one <laughs> out there. Nick. That, thank you. I, I think, that, I think that's, that's great. Uh, I'm Gary LeBranch, and, uh, you know, I, I trust uh, the people that are... that work hard, that try their hardest that might not have been given everything in the world, but they they want to make a go of it for themselves and for their families. And they're, they're salt of the earth type people, people that are work, working hard for the right reasons and are willing to give back to their community and, and, and share with others. That, those are who I trust. That's beautiful. All right, Matt, you're up. I'm Matthew Duva. Um, well, I think I have to say, uh, and I, I believe it too, but I have I trust mm-hmm. science. I trust data. I trust facts, uh, which I think are, exist in the <laughs> world and and are out there to be validated. Um, but I, I I would sort of uh, humbly agree uh, with Gary and say that I trust 
people who are willing to be vulnerable, people who ask questions um, and who um, recognize and acknowledge and they don't know something and when they, you know, because I think it gives them credibility. But, um, but I've got to say, I trust Well, them. I have to say thank you to all of you. This was fantastic. And guys... Last show. This is, well, it's not the last show ever. The last, last show. It's, it's the last show Winter for this show. season, yes. And uh, I trust all of you. I am. I trust in Association Chat and this wonderful community, and I'm so thankful that we have you watching uh, online right now. The, those of you who are listening to this later um, are part of it. And if you want to find out more, go to associationchat.com. Until next time, everyone. Keep asking questions to learn every day. As Joseph Campbell once said, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. Have a great week, everyone. Thanks for listening to Association Chat, produced by Amplified Growth and Human Factor. For more information on Amplified Growth, go to amplifiedgrowth.net. And for more information on making podcasts for your association, go to Human Factor at humanfactor.net. To hear past episodes, go to the Association Chat YouTube channel and subscribe. See you soon!